Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, Tess Proust here, President of South Africa, um, also the founder of Crystal Events and Incentives for Africa. Um, we've got a fantastic panel joining us today. Um, one is running a little bit late, that is Tony Ukochikwa from Nigeria, um, MD of Aviators Africa. Um, then we have Mr. Rob Kuchira, who is uh, Director for Radisson Hotels in East Africa. We have Mr. Graham Wood, um, uh, Chief Operating Officer of Sun International. Uh, Rebecca from uh, Site uh, Head Office in Chicago, Rebecca Wright, uh, helping us tremendously with chapter support. And thank you for getting up early, Rebecca. And finally, Rick Taylor. I'm sure everybody knows Rick. Um, started the Cape Town Convention Bureau, amongst other things, many moons ago, and today consults for uh, African Convention Bureaus across the continent. So he also has a great helicopter view across, um, across the African my sector. What we'd like to explore today is um, where Africa stands within this whole COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and a bit of positiveness, hopefully not too premature, we um, see very low numbers of infections comparatively. Um, then again, we're not sure how many regions have not been tested, but even so, um, it's looking positive than the rest uh, compared to the rest of the world. So hypothetical question is, um, is there an opportunity for Africa to bounce back in terms of travel, mice business in particular, um, and trade in general, um, possibly ahead of the pack, um, and it's something we are going to explore. Um, Rick, I'd like to start with you, if we may, if, if you can give us a bit of background um, uh, on your recent uh, exploits, and how do you see the landscape? What is the ideal landscape for Africa to go back to business? Over to you. Hi, Tess. A very good afternoon to you, and uh, hi to the panelists. Yeah, I mean, uh, great, great question. It reminds me of uh, one of Jack Welch's famous comments where, you know, change before you have to, particularly in this uh, C-19 situation. So it's really at a very important time for our industry, not only domestically, but worldwide. I have always been, as you all have been around the table, high, high fans of Africa. So I think, you know, if you look at the current sort of market share of Africa in mice terms, it's really small. It's you know, up to 3% of, of, uh, of market share worldwide. So the flip side of that is, hey guys, we've got 97% opportunity. And that's perhaps where we need to focus. If you look at uh, what is happening, certainly in East Africa that I've always maintained is like the next center of gravity when it comes specifically to mice. Um, you know, the convention bureaus we work very closely with in, uh, and established in, in Rwanda, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya are coming out of, uh, coming out of the ground proverbially. proverbially. Um, and as indeed is Tanzania. So if you look at the future, I think mice is going to be really a, a, a key part and parcel, a key, if you, if you like, to start to drive the recovery, the recovery on, on the African continent. But with that will come a lot, of, uh, a lot of hard work. I think we're going to need new products, particularly com coming back to the site proposition, where you know, incentives are going, to, um, you know, are, go are going to change. I think our target markets, our reward winners are going to change, really because um, you know, sustainability has become the next big conversation, hasn't it? What I call the sort of the, the, the Greta generation. So uh, they're going to be wanting different products, maybe not necessarily the five, six star kind of stuff, because there's this, this trend, I think, again, coming, sticking to the site agenda particularly, away from sort of consumption to contribution. They want to leave today's winners, today's um, uh, uh, delegates, want to leave something of, of, of purpose uh, back, back in, the, in, in, in the destination. So it'll be moving away, and I think this is where DMCs will need to take cognizance of the fact that experience over destination is going to be key. Uh, local is going to be important. We, will, we always talk about local. 
if you look at some of the hotels um, at the moment, a lot of them have propositions to buy local. Now, obviously with the uh, COVID-19 situation, that supply chain or that value chain has sadly um, uh, sort of uh, weakened a bit and certainly has softened, which comes back to the conversation we were having just before we came online that uh, Graham and Rob were talking about. You know, what is happening to occupancies, which are down, if not below, single digits. So that's, that's horrible in itself. So those are just some of the bigger pictures, but I think as we go forward, Tess and, and panel, Africa is the next frontier. There's loads of opportunity. East Africa is getting its, um, its, its, its governments aligned. Governments are starting to fully appreciate the economic impact of this thing called MICE. There's a, a, a sort of a, 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 solid, a, solid, a solidification of comprehension of how that particular ecosystem works. The next um, sort of area on the continent will be West Africa. That may be, you know, uh, in terms of timelines, whew, a year or two behind, we've already started to do some preliminary work in Togo. So that's exciting in itself. But um, Africa, as, uh, as I've just referenced, I think is categorically going to be globally the, the next opportunity, the next frontier when it comes to certainly business events. Thank you, Rick. Um, that, that was pretty insightful. I'm very happy that uh, Tony from Nigeria has managed to join us. Um, Tony, welcome. Um, I gather you've probably picked up the gist of the conversation that Rick was uh, talking about just now in terms of how ready will Africa be to bounce back into business, especially in the MICE arena, but also with trade and travel in general. Now, with your expertise as far as aviation is concerned, um, can you give us like a helicopter view? Uh, what will be required in terms of legislation, you know, governments uh, collaborating airlift across um, the continent, possibly new routes coming on board uh, that we haven't seen before. And then finally, um, we heard this morning that SAA might not make it. Um, with that assumption, um, give, us, give us your take, Tony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tess. Um, apologies for um, signing in a little bit late. Um, okay, right, straight up to the point. Um, so yes, uh, there's a very big impact on the aviation industry uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation. Uh, bouncing back would be for the aviation industrial industry, which was the hardest hit, will be slow and sluggish. Um, with the with the whole impact, we're going to see airlines are going to contract big time. Um, but the, the key thing to understand here is that. African governments, which a whole lot of them actually were uh, pressing on having their state carriers before this happened, there's going to be, a, the narrative is going to change a whole lot. Um, so it's not specific, uh, there's no clear picture on how uh, uh, governments will bail out airlines yet at the moment. Um, but also, if you look at government bailing out airlines, it's going to be a bad dream because um, you got, government should look at a free market and help airlines that are really in the free market to operate in their regions rather than you know putting money on national carriers. Look at the SA example for SA uh, SA for example. Um, government doesn't want to put any more money. Um, that's if should in case SA goes down, there's going to be a deep gap in the industry. I mean. Vis a vis the kind of definition is serving in the continent and outside the continent, then there's going to be a big gap. But on the brighter side, we'll see airlines we'll see. begin to consolidate, uh, do it so shrink to be more bigger and have more economically stable. Uh, because we have a lot of, for example, in Nigeria, we have uh, close to six domestic carriers with, with uh, close to 72 aircraft parked. Um, post COVID 19, we should see airlines contracts partner, collaborate, bring the number, lesser airlines, but bigger in capacity to be able to cater for the market. And about concerning airlift, we should see basically begin to happen. I think Satam should come down on 
some of the bogus announcements is making and begin to make basic uh, announcements. Yeah, for example, countries should relax their visa regimes. Let's start with the basic things. Okay, let us be able to travel to each other places without without hassle. That will motivate the market. But if there are visa, uh, uh, visa restrictions still up in the place, it's going to even make it more harder for people to be motivated to travel for my or business or what have you. So that's my take for the for the time being. Tony, that's that's very interesting. Thank you very much. And in fact, if I might touch on it, um, for anybody who's been attending the Avia Dev webinars recently, there's there's certainly a strong um, motivation to look at uh, an African airline alliance. Um, Tony, do you want to elaborate on any of that? I'm not sure if there's been any further pr uh, progress since we last. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, so basically, um, there hasn't been a proper African alliance pre-COVID-19. We should see that post-COVID-19, if the airline industry in Africa should survive. I mean, if you look at the European model, there's a lot of collaboration and alliances all over the place. Um, but for some reason, because of state government and protectionism, the alliances have, it's not been easy for the alliances before now. But I'm hoping with the whole COVID-19 issue and how the market government I mean, impacted economies in Africa, we should see more alliances in the aviation industry or in the airline industry because of the 19 for the sustainability of the airline business. If not, we're going to have a whole lot of issues. Thank you, Tony. Um, Rob, I'd like to direct towards um, Eastern Africa now um, with, with your hotels and, and properties um, over there that's done really well until COVID-19. Um, I I just like to touch on destinations like Kenya, you know, talking about the, the visa regimes. Kenya is probably one of the easiest countries in the world um, as far as visa um, access is concerned. And, and Rwanda, um, very similar. Um, Rob, how, how do you see the, the, this whole situation playing out in terms of making it easier to travel to your, to your destinations with Kenya and East Africa already being popular um, what, what do you see, what, what should happen in order to, to make it come back? All right, Tess and everybody, and thank you. Uh, good question. Um, if we look at East Africa and we look at the, the passport and the visa controls coming through, obviously there's going to have to be collaboration between government and private sector going forward. And, and the state we are at the moment with this COVID-19, um, everybody is in trouble. It's not just uh, a couple of hotels that are in trouble. It's uh, the whole market economy is down. And they would definitely have to have a look at that first and foremost by the time. And, and who knows when that's going to happen? Um, two months, three months down the line, four months. Um, it's very difficult to say. But I think from a, a Kenyan point of view, I was just telling Graham earlier on, that um, the Kenyan government is absolutely handling this COVID-19 phenomenally well. And what they, we, we've got a, a, a lockdown of um, uh, flights until the end of April, but we're in a curfew at the moment. So we, we can still move around during the day. But I think the ultimate uh, goal is, is to try and get the count down and then to try and open the business locally um, at least least get, get the local economy going and then from there expand and then look at obviously opening the, the borders once again and in the interim from now until then the, the discussions and, and negotiations will have to be from an African point of view with all the African countries because as everybody's saying Africa is the next destination and I also think with the numbers being low as you mentioned earlier on is, is it's going to be a lot more attractive than any other the country at the moment, um, and starting off initially, uh, with its two, three months, four months time, five months time, um, coming back. So they would definitely have to have a look at um, making the visa controls a lot easier um, going forward, without a doubt. Thanks, Rob. Excuse me, Rob. We're having a hard time hearing you, Rob. I don't know if you can turn up your volume or maybe get closer to your microphone. Thank you. 
Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Rob, thank you for that. Um, and I think visa regimes uh, come up in every single conference and forum that, that we talk about developing business uh, within um, and intra-Africa. Um, Graham, let's, let's hop over to you. If you can give us uh, your overview of um, what's happening on your side of the industry at the moment. Um, uh, Obviously, with a place like Sun City, it's, it's a massive venue, um, used to doing mass events, and, and all of that has been stopped in its tracks. How do you foresee mice business um, returning, and, and what is your ideal climate for that to happen? Uh, thanks, Tess. Uh, that's a very difficult question to answer because the unknown is when we're going to when will we will we return? Uh, we have a lockdown in place till the end of April. May be extended. We don't know. Um, it's been extended once. Uh, like uh, Rob was saying, I think the South African government has done a tremendous job in in mitigating the risks associated with a with a very fast spreading pandemic. But I think at this stage the the level the infection rates is still at a point where the lockdown makes sense uh, but even if we return at the end of april uh, with there are going to be and it's not only here it's going to be everywhere else in africa and around the world there are going to be restrictions put in place so the freedom of movement is going to be a, a challenge whether it be domestic trying to get your domestic uh, travel and meetings business uh, working first, because that's logically what would happen, um, versus the global mice business moving, uh, because it may be dependent on airlift restrictions. But most important question we should be asking ourselves is what's the rate of recovery in our source markets mm -hmm. as to where, the, where your source of demand is going to come from? Because... The supply is one thing. We can get supply ready, but if you've got airlift restrictions and you've got source, you've got sentiment in source markets problematic, I think you're going to, you need to be very realistic in what your expectations are from a return of site business and, and or, sorry, mice business demand into, into our destinations. Because uh, what is mice dependent on? Mice is dependent on economic prosperity to some degree in our various source markets. And each source market's gonna be under tremendous economic pressure coming out of, out of COVID. So I, I can honestly say that as far as we look at it at Sun International, we can write 2020 off. And I think you can probably only see some return of international demand, whether it be mice or uh, international inbound leisure, probably mid 2021 into our market. Because there's two things you, well, there's one thing that you also got to be very mindful of when it comes to global mice traffic is, and global tourism traffic is that the longer haul destinations are going to take more time to recover. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be dependent on how, how much sentiment uh, improves in our source markets and the desire for people to, to want to travel. The, it does create an opportunity for intra-regional demand and traffic, and I think that's something that we're, we're focusing on in this discussion, which I think is important. How do we create uh, more movement of demand and business amongst our, our various regions and our various countries within Africa? But I, I think the one thing that, I, that is really starting to hit home with me is... What is the experience going to be for our guests, whether they be a business tourist or a leisure tourist? What is the, what is the mindset of that tourist going to be? Uh, and what are the expectations going to be when they start traveling again? People, uh, human beings are social creatures. We will travel again and we will interact and we will meet with one another again in person. But what are the expectations when you do travel? And I think Rick touched on it uh, earlier. There is going to be a very, very important question surrounding what is the tourism supply chain doing with regards to health and hygiene? 
and what is it doing with regards to the authenticity of the experience that people are going to be looking for? Because people are going to be locked up for a period of time. They're not going to have been at uh, the, the social interaction is going to be lesser and people are going to yearn for that, but they're going to yearn for experiences that are, are, are going to be authentic in nature, because I think that's what people are yearning for. And so we're, we're looking very carefully at, at our customer experience and our offering with regards to what we start doing. I was thinking about it the other day, a simple thing. Uh, hand lotion is one of our amenities that are, exist in our hotel rooms. I'm not so sure how many people use the hand lotion to be for a start, but chances are we're probably going to replace that with a small tube of hand sanitizer. You know, these are the things that we start to start thinking about in terms of how we deliver uh, whilst we try and grapple with the estimation of when we think demand's going to return. Graham, thank you. And in fact, uh, you've directed me to towards my, my next question to the panel. Um, I'm going to start with Rick and then uh, Rob, jump over to you. And if we can finally come back to Tony to talk about this in the airlines. And in fact, I had this question on Twitter from Judy uh, Kefagona from Kenya, who is our queen of sustainability in Africa. Um, and hopefully she can join us on our next discussion. How do we de-risk mass events? How do we make people feel safe? And Graham, you've, I think you've touched the nail on the head over there. Um, but let's start with Rick, because um, obviously we have to start some way to put our convention centers and, and large venues back to use instead of becoming white elephants. Over to you, Rick. Thank you, Tess. I just want to uh, loop back for a moment, if I may, to the conversation um, you had with Rob vis-a-vis -vis visas and Kenya specifically. But I think, as, as, as I mentioned in my opening comments, I'd really do, if you look at uh, just through the lens of business tourism, uh, business events, and indeed leisure, East Africa is, the, is categorically, in my opinion, the next center of gravity. And you, if you look at that block of countries and destinations, Rwanda already, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking now under correction, they've already from an African point of view, I believe, or are about to lift all visa restrictions on any incoming uh, delegate or uh, um, uh, holiday maker in, into that country. So the, I think the visa conversation around Africa, I think we all fully appreciate the the correctness about it, the discipline about it, but I, th I see already uh, through the lens of Rwanda that softening. And if you look at the next year or two, I think East Africa, the visa, can I call it a hurdle, will in itself also start, uh, also start to soften. And then coming back to, uh, to Graham's point about where does this all restart and how do we reignite this economic engine? And I think what we are advising our clients, it, it kind of starts at home. So from a, a convention bureau point of view, or even a resort point of view, hotel point of view, there are a, a raft of associations in our own backyards, in South Africa, in, in Nairobi, in, in East Africa. So, that, so those kinds of leads, those kinds of conversations can already commence with, once again, as we all, all fully appreciate the fact that associations, corporate meetings, even incentives uh, tests, talking to you, back to your expertise, it's not going to ha happen, you know, tomorrow or whatever, uh, certainly in the next month or two's time. Um, and I concur totally with what Graham's point of view on 2020, sadly, is um, a bit of a write-off. But the flip side of that is, you know, how do we use the next six months to revisit our business plans. I don't think the MICE sector per se is going to come out of the starting blocks with a whole brand new blueprint. Um, you know, certainly in uh, our advisory work we do is we always look, to, uh, and uh, uh, this is also uh, a conversation, we always look to a 10-year horizon. The first year or so is about operational excellence, getting the bureau, getting the client up to speed so we can compete 
with international best practices. The next sort of two, three years is taking that operational excellence and planting, looking at a growth strategy. And the next four to 10 years, that's the kind of horizon, is then looking at, you know, how do we bring this entire complex of, of thinking together? And of course, I mean, right now with COVID, coming back to your question about, you know, how do we de-risk things going forward? One of the things we, we've been um, really quite surprised to find out that across many uh, tourism boards, there isn't really this uh, a, a black swan strategy, if you like, or there isn't this, well, we also call it a sort of a, a raid strategy. You know, what, what are the risks? What are the ideas? You know, wh where is that plan? It might, if it, if it is there, it might have to come off for the, um, the, the minister's shelf and a bit of dust blown off it or what have you. But, you know, that has been a missing, uh, coming back to Judy's question about how do we de-risk the way forward? Well, the whole thing is, you know, let's take cognizance of the fact that these, sadly, um, these crises do happen. It will happen again. We all, if you look at through the, the backward lens, we all, we all reference, you know, 9-11 and I think uh, COVID-19 is perhaps our tourism 9-11. Life will come back. And again, coming back to what Graham was saying and, and Rob and, and, and co. But the question is when? And uh, so your, your de-risk question and answer is kind of linked back to, to when it is. And picking up the South African conversation about uh, some of the rumors I've certainly uh, been exposed to. And I think, Tess, I've shared that uh, COVID, those various life cycles. The, the panacea, if I listen to my doctor friends in, uh, who I'm uh, reaching out to, a country has to close down for 49 days. That's it. That's the best opportunity. And you can see those other four or five scenarios. I believe I shared it with you, Tess, uh, just from a conversational point of view. F 49 days, that's it. Then you have the, on, the, on the other side, you know, how do you de-risk these kinds of things going forward? Then you've got that, her that entire herd mentality conversation, which is something that perhaps the rest of the panelists can also look at. So de-risking going forward is going to be making sure next time this happens, there is a blueprint that is part, is part and parcel of management's conversation. And I'm gonna say monthly might be a bit much, but at least quarterly, that document, that, that way forward has gotta be um, uh, top of mind. And that'll lead to, uh, I think, a whole lot of activations um, that can keep jobs going and the economy as well. Thank you, Rick. Um, Rob, Let's, let's move across to you. What, what Rick has just touched on with regard to uh, the de-risking events. Uh, looking at your upper hotel in Nairobi, um, I think proudly uh, the best security in the world as far as hotels and access go. How do you keep the bugs out? It's going to be extremely difficult now. Obviously, I'm not a, a, a doctor when it comes to these things. But yep. Rob, we can't hear you at all right now. Now it's feedback. Uh, let me try and get this up and going. Ooh, that's good. That's good. That's good. Don't move. <laughs> that's good. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, as I was saying, I'm, I'm not a doctor when it comes to, the, to these expert things, but I, I, I foresee uh, similar to if you try travel into Africa currently at the moment, you, you've got to have all the injections and yellow fever injections and all of those. And I foresee something with, with that type of um, certification coming forward, um, whether they find the vaccination or something that uh, you, you get a jab and then, and then you can travel and, and move around. But I think more importantly, it's, it's, it's keeping the hygiene and keeping the current trend that, that everybody's doing at the moment with, with the hygiene, the, 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 the distancing, the face mask, all that, keeping that at least as long as possible. Although it's going to look absolutely stupid with people arriving at two, three hundred people with, with a meeting and all the markup. But I mean, that's the, the new normal. 
um, I foresee going forward. Um, until such stage as, as this COVID-19 is completely under control and no one knows when that's going to happen. That's the, the unfortunate thing. And um, eventually, um, economies would have to start getting back. So the sooner we start getting back and putting measures in place to unrisk it, uh, the better would, would be for everybody. Thanks, Rob. Um, you know, it reminds me, how many of us have been on a long haul uh, plane trip, sometimes not even that long, and we get off with a cold or, or flu on the other side. Um, so in the meantime, m a lot of countries that you travel to, they walk up and down the aisles with these bug sprays to make sure that you don't bring, bring back or pick up any bugs. Um, hopefully they'll in, you know, develop something to that effect for, um, for COVID. Uh, viruses, which we can spray into our conference rooms and our hotel lobbies, etc. But that's all into the future. Um, in the meantime, whilst we don't have the answers, um, let's be proactive and start looking at what if. Once this thing is over, um, how really can we get ourselves to get back to business as much as possible? And on that note, um, I'd like to hand back to Tony. Um, just to, to share for those who's not reading the, uh, the, the comments, um, comment from John, CEO of AviaDev. Um, totally agree, John, um, African aviation, uh, there's an opportunity for private airlines. Um, and those are the commercial mindset to be created and developed at, at ground zero. So time to reset and re uh, sorry, reinvent business models, not to go back to business as usual as African airlines as they were losing money as a unit in the first place. And, and with that in mind, Tony, over to you. Okay, um, so basically, John, John, uh, John, John just put it, uh, succinctly put it, um, but I'm afraid, uh, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but I'm afraid it should not be business as usual, but I'm afraid that some government in Africa still don't understand the impact of COVID-19 yet for them to begin to or to realign their policies post COVID-19. Because after now, just like John said, there should be a reset. What should we be thinking in the airline industry will be safety, sensitization, I mean sanitization, and sustainability. These three S's will push us in the way to, you know, being able to be sustainable in running our businesses because the customer's mindsets are gonna be different now. So I mean, how safety, how safe is your airline? Are you guys very health conscious about your operations? And what is your sustainability plans and policies going forward? So basically, there should be a total reset to policies and how things are going. But I'm afraid because most airlines are run by government, and we know how government is fully involved with running the airlines in Africa. It's something that should really go to the private sector and you know to spare ahead the post-COVID-19 operations to stay us out of this quagmire again. So that's my perspective. Thank you, Tony. Um, on that point about governments collaborating and cooperating, um, do you think, and I'll redirect this question to Rick again, do you think it's going to be easier or probably no change into the future with governments, African governments in particular, collaborating and opening up those African skies to increase and improve on airlift uh, and, and destinations within the continent? Yes, so for me, I, go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Thanks, Tony. Tess, my, my, my lens on the entire situation is, you know, Africa, as we said earlier, and I think we're all concurring, is the next frontier. <laughs> it's like Christopher Columbus going out all those years ago and discovering America. The, con the, the continent and the countries need to be discovered by the world. We've talked about globalization. If you look at the airlines, I think... Um, the market share of African airlines, and Tony and John, if you're still there, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the market share of African airlines on our, in our own backyard, on our own continent, is, is no more than 20%. Yeah. So the upside is, what are we going to do about this um, at a policy level, at a government level? It's, it's, it's there. We need management. We need the marketing. We need to build the confidence in this in this continent, because it has got so much going for it. And I think what this COVID-19 has done, and again, with enormous respect, it's kind of leveled, leveled the playing field. The entire world has caught this, 
has caught this cold. And we're all struggling, whether it's the, uh, North America, whether it's Africa, whether it's Asia, whether it's Europe. And if you look at the, um, the, the, the facts on the table, and, and, and facts can be our friends, there is an upside to this. And now the thing is, do we as Africans per se, what do, how do we grasp this? What do we do about it? Do we just carry on uh, business as usual and uh, many, many commentators all over the world saying it's business unusual categorically? But I think, you know, as, as strategists and futurists, uh, we need to double click on that and, 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 and trail what is that unusual? What does it mean? How do, what does it translate uh, in, into? And I think we spoke about on the incentive side of it um, when, we had, uh, when we first kicked off. You know, the incentive product is going to have to change. But to bring um, the, the, the winners to the, uh, the second tier destination, well, we're going to need transport. So in places like in Europe, for example, I think the air side is perhaps in terms of market share is going to shrink. So there's a whole lot of thinking and planning going on around uh, um, driving shorter distances, driving, uh, or if, if the destination is a bit further, taking the train. So, you know, these are conversations that we as an industry need to have, and they'll be very different in South Africa from Graham's lens point of view, and very different from East Africa from Rob's point of view, and very different from West African point of view. So somehow, as, you know, we need to link all these thinkings together. Um, but back to your point, Tess, yeah, I, I think governments uh, have to step up to the plate, and I say this with enormous respect, take control, understand the industry, its ecosystem, and don't let this happen again. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Graham's uh, got his hand up, but I just want to see, Tony, did you want to add to that before we switch to Graham? Yes, I was just going to add to, to the fact that, yeah, we, just like, I mean, you really say 20% and most 80% is from Africa. So even in cargo, is most big, the four big airlines and uh, most uh, African airlines that take the highest amount of cargo in Africa, I mean, to, in, to intra-African market. So basically, we, we, we need to pull our strength, you know, in the aviation industry. Um, I, I just want to take a typical example of an of a, a private airline doing so well in the West African region, Africa World Airlines. I mean, it's a profitable airline working so well out of Ghana and connecting in the region. Now, for such an airline, the Ghanaian government, rather than looking for a, a national career, a pipeline dream to put money in, should support such private investments because already they have shown over time that they can be profitable and they can scale. So such are the, the things that, such are, such investment is what governments in Africa should look, look into and kind of support rather than just having a bogus you know, policy around airline and not clear cut ways of how to make airlines come out of you know, this uh, special COVID-19. So just like Rick said, they should step up the plate and you know, really put their step, uh, you know, put their, their mouth where they uh, put the money where their mouth is. Amazing, Tony. Thank you. Um, definitely positive there and uh, opportunities for private airlines to start cooperating and collaborating. Um, on that note, Graham, over to you. Uh, test three points. Um, first point is, and I saw it's been raised by one of the comments by Cornet from Convention Bureau in the Western Cape, and it just triggered a couple of thoughts. And he makes reference to new cleaning and hygiene standards. Well, they've always been in place, certainly in hotels. But I think what COVID has taught us is to the importance of uh, revisiting those practices. So whether it be food hygiene processes, how we, uh, you know, how we uh, display food on buffets, etc., and looking at ways of it being more. Uh, hygienic from a food safety point of view, but I think that in our meeting space, we have to start relooking at in the short term. Certainly, look start relooking seating capacities in our meeting space, because so traditional one and a half square meters per person in a in a configuration that you would allow for for a for a meeting room setup that's got to change. So I think it's going to have an impact on size of groups, 
uh, that are going to be traveling um, and seating capacities in, in meeting space venues. So that's one comment that we're thinking about. The second comment is in terms of, you know, how do we, what activates a, a return in demand in the meeting space uh, into Africa? I think there's two things that we're, there's three, there's three enablers. One is airlift, and uh, we've spoken a lot about that. I, I'm not concerned from an SAA point of view, uh, whether SAA survives or not, in the context of inbound into South Africa. Of course, I'm concerned about jobs and the loss of jobs, but the other international airlines will pick up those routes. Uh, you just have to look what's been happening in the Western Cape with the additional uh, airlines that have been flying into Cape Town over recent time and what that's done to the tourism plant in, in Cape Town. That's because uh, West Grow, the city of Cape Town, the Western Cape province, and have got together and they've, they've, they've made it happen. So it can happen. Um, I think the regional air traffic uh, within our within South Africa is a concern and within Africa, but I think we've covered that and Tony's better, best to talk about that rather than me. The other point I wanna make is the exchange rate has got to start having a positive impact on tourism growth in demand into Africa because essentially inbound mice business is an export uh, product and, and we can certainly create uh, pricing efficiencies for ourselves in the context of of the of a forward view on the exchange rate provided we as operators are responsible in our pricing and i think that's uh, that that that's got to be left up to each operator and each uh, uh, owner of, of product to decide how they want to price but probably the most important enabler it is and it's behind you in your backdrop is the beauty of our people across our continent and the beauty of our attractions. We have unique attractions and unique experiences that nobody else can offer. And if we just talk to and play to our strengths and, and, and be proactive in our, our marketing message and our, and, our, and our communication plans so that we are a, we're not part of the clutter, but we stand out from the clutter in terms of what we offer, and we go back to this authenticity that I spoke about and talk to our strengths of our people and our attractions, it's got to stand us in good stead as we move forward. That's fantastic, Graham. Thank you. And I, I totally agree with you. And, and on the point of uh, marketing and, you know, putting out there what's, what's in our backyard, um, and I hope everybody likes my 12 apostles here behind me. Um, you know, I have seen the most amazing messages from Kenya um, on Instagram and on LinkedIn and everywhere. Um, I think Kenya is probably the most proactive country when it comes to reminding people, hello, we're here. Um, think about us when we start traveling again. Um, and then the other thing you pointed on is your pricing policies. Uh, probably we are in danger of seeing a, a radical price war when uh, business um, starts traveling again. Um, Rob, I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, what are your thoughts on all of the above? The, with the Kenyan government, um, and we go back about a month, uh, a month to a month and a half, uh, also bearing in mind that we were hit with a security alert before the COVID-19 uh, in um, towards the end of uh, February. So we, we were hit with a double whammy. We had the security alert. And then on top of that uh, came the COVID-19. So uh, the the government was very proactive in um, putting putting aside five million dollars that um, is for the return of the market back into Kenya. So I'm glad to hear that you are seeing posts uh, from the from the uh, tourism bureau. In Kenya and and they're doing a sterling job with that so from that point of view they are definitely a step ahead and they're already thinking whether that is four months five months six months whenever the business starts returning but they're already putting the word out there and as Graham mentioned uh, the unique uh, countries that we all have and the beauties that we have those are the those are the issues that we should be marketing out to the world and 
with the exchange rate being favorable to the world, um, particularly in East Africa, and I know that, 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 that the RAND is taking a hit as well, um, it should be affordable for, for, for the people to come through. So from that point of view, um, I think Kenya is definitely a step ahead um, with their marketing and they've allocated the funds that's there. The Minister of Tourism, which I'm in communication quite often, and um, they're really doing a good job with it. Oh, awesome and, and well done Kenya and uh, the Kenya uh, Tourism Bureau. Um, Rick? Yes, can I just add and support yeah, what, uh, what Rob is saying? I mean, yesterday was, as you all know, GMID. And uh, we had a whole plan um, with, with the, uh, the Kenya National Convention Bureau, which actually started to trend worldwide. We spent like gosh, uh, Monday and Tuesday doing a whole pre-Twitter uh, pre plan strategy. And as we went on a little bit of sort of hijacked marketing, but supporting uh, Global Meetings Industry Day, sending uh, tweets out, appropriate tweets. The entire campaign was, I thought, really well orchestrated by the team. Um, and as a consequence, picking up exactly what you're picking up as industry, there is this awareness growing behind this, this new destination that's percolating in, uh, in, in that part of the world. And I also just wanted to say that, um, I, like many of you around the table this afternoon, I guess you, you tuned into much of what was happening around um, Global Meetings Industry Day yesterday. And one of the conversations we really in, uh, enjoyed listening to was um, along these kinds of lines, but it was the, the head of Merit, Merit Travel, uh, Steve. And he was saying that if, if you look at his book, um, business right now is, 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 is soft, but it, they are chock-a-block. They're running, I think, 300 groups in uh, August, September. And it goes August, September, October, November. Then, of course, as it gets towards the end of the year, it, 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 it softens. But there seems to be different um, appetites to travel, to, to work. So it would appear from Merit's client's point of view, there is still business and it would appear pretty good business on their books so so good for them yeah well that's a positive wow um before we move on i'd just like to touch on a, a comment from our uh, site global president jen glenn um just referring to the hygiene practices and the fact that um most clients are now asking for those specifics in their proposals um and just to read what uh, last of a sentence, what to keep, how to keep attendees safe through cleaning practices, and uh, does that put them back at risk if somebody gets sick? In other words, does that become a liability? Um, that also reminds me a very interesting question on insurance, um, and we should probably have a separate discussion on this. Uh, questions being raised on the possibility of having insurance against a situation like this, where you cancel and you lose a hotel, for instance, or a venue losing all their bookings, apart from having to refund the money and being broke, um, is there any opportunity to look at insurance coverage uh, for these sort of situations? Um, but that's a separate discussion. Um, Graham, did you want to touch on that quickly? Sorry, I was Sorry, just, I uh, thought you put uh, up your hand. <laughs> okay. No, I did. I did. Um, and I, for the life of me, have forgotten what I was going to say. But it was something that Rick was uh, mentioning. Uh, anyway, it'll come back to me. Sorry. No, no problem at all. Um, I think we've got about five minutes left. Uh, Rebecca, are we still good for time? Very good, yeah. Excellent, excellent. I'm going to start with Tony for some parting words. And then um, if there's any questions from the audience, uh, please pop them into our Q&As and then we'll try and answer them as quickly as possible. Tony, over to you. So my part is sure to be that um, African Airlines should strategize and just like same one, reset their, their plans, go back to the drawing board and see how they are going to do post-COVID their operations. And uh, because the truth is, after COVID-19, people want to travel. But then, what incentive, what motivation are you as an airline giving them to, want, to make them want to travel? And also want to say that, just like Rick said, East Africa is the most prepared for people to travel to. 
I've had some people in Nigeria already waiting, pointing out to East Africa, for, for example, Rwanda, Kenya, and the most probably the place, the countries that Africans who want to travel to us. Um, also, if you look at events coming on later in the year, for example, um, Magical Kenya is probably placed towards October. So people are looking at, okay, towards the end of, towards the, end of the year or post COVID-19, where are the possible places or events or mice events that I would be possible want to travel to? So these are what these are the things that are going on the blue So airlines should actually, should actually get ready and look at how they can create packages that will motivate travelers to want to jump on them and want to travel again. So the 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 the, the, the onus is on them to actually look for ways to attract people because the truth is people definitely will want to travel after COVID nineteen. Thank you, Tony. That's possibly another separate discussion as well, um, possibly between the likes of yourselves, um, airlines, tour operators and DMCs, um, finding those opportunities and the motivators, the enablers to, to give confidence to people to get on the plane again. Um, I think, uh, Graham, shall we move across to you for parting words? Yeah, I remember now what I was wanting to say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what I was going to say is that just following on from what Rick was saying, um, our outlook is is definitely we're, we're we're preparing for a very slow pickup because it's the prudent thing to do because what it is doing for a lot of operators uh, and suppliers and product owners is it should be giving you the opportunity to reset your the way you structure your business. We, we've asked our, our every one of our hotels. Uh, two very simple questions. Why do you do things this way and how can you do it better or differently? And it is amazing the stuff that's coming out. We are we're finding efficiencies in the way we, way we operate. I'll give you a very simple example. We, uh, we, we, we are doing, we had a tender going out at Sun City for the cleaning of our pools, and we, swimming pools. And we have, I don't know, we have 12 or 15 or whatever the number is. And the traditional tender was, you know, a whole bunch of people walking around cleaning pools manually. But there's automated pool cleaning systems that are out there that are so much more efficient, work at night, you don't interrupt, interrupt the guest experience, and that you end up saving, a f and it costs you a fraction of what you were going to do because you've, you've done certain things the way you've been doing them all the time. So that's what's happening to us. And that's a good thing that's coming out of COVID. I mean, of course, we want revenue to come back and we want it to come back quickly, but we're going to come back with an enhanced customer experience, different cost structures, and there is still demand that is on the books for the rest of the year. Now, will it move or not? I don't know. We've got a major multinational that's booked out uh, the Table Bay and Hotel in Cape Town in November for four days. They have not moved yet. Hopefully, they won't. They say we're still coming, and it's a multi. It's coming from all around the world. So we've just got to hold on to those pieces of business, work with our partners, work with the DMCs, uh, work with the airlines and, and, and keep, put our best foot forward, start, keep talking up a positive game and uh, it will come back. It's just a question of, uh, of when and we, and we can't control that. Yeah, absolutely, Graham. And in fact, that is uh, very positive news. Uh, the secret is... Um, to, to keep in touch with your clients, you know, try to get them to, to hang in there. And uh, as Hugh Tuckett started the conversation, when this whole thing broke is um, don't cancel, postpone wherever possible. Um, we also had a, a question from Rita here. Do any of us have an idea when overseas travel could be opening up again? Um, Rita, the short reply is no. Um, all our crystal balls are as clear as mud at the moment and it probably wouldn't be responsible to resume international travel until they have this virus under control. That's just my um, uneducated uh, response. Um, then just uh, to talk about site and uh, our, our plans we had for 2020, Rick and I um, and Colette worked around the clock to put together a strategic plan for the new site Africa, which was launched in September last year. Um, so we used to be site South Africa, then Southern Africa, and all of a sudden we've got one big family, uh, continental family, to uh, help us develop incentive travel. Um, we launched this strategic plan to all our members and the industry at uh, Meetings Africa on the 25th of February. 
while talk about control or delete Rick, um, I think probably a lot of our strategies and, and uh, plans we could still continue with, but under the circumstances, site has to go back to the drawing board and write a completely new strategic plan to, to keep our current situation in mind. Um, and that will probably include uh, engaging with various governments to basically continue our discussion from today and to see where our opportunities are to collaborate, open up borders, relax visas, in, increase um, airlift uh, across Africa and, uh, you know, start trading. Um, on that note, uh, Rob, I'm going to hand over you for final words, please. Sure, thanks, Chris. Um, I fully agree with uh, what uh, Graham is saying in terms of uh, re-looking at the businesses. So all the all the hotels and groups are doing exactly that, and uh, it's amazing what actually comes out of uh, the woodwork. And and it will definitely be a lot more efficient uh, operational processes going forward. Uh, the the new normal. From the East Africa point of view, if, if we have a look currently, we had about 60% cancellations and 40% postponements of the, of the MICE business going forward. So again, uh, from a leisure point of view, it's a peak season coming into, into Kenya with the, the migration from uh, the Masai Mara. So at the moment, hopefully, uh, and again, no one's got the crystal ball, but um, hopefully the, the business comes back uh, sooner than, than later. And uh, but uh, up until tight, we are at the hygiene of uh, training of staff and new normal going forward. So. Thank you, Rob. Um, Rebecca, would you like to, to say anything before I handle, uh, before I hand the final uh, words over to Rick? Um, yeah. but, um, just coming back at the site Africa. that are waiting to be discovered. And I think the, the team around the table here and those uh, other role players on the continent and across the world can definitely help us uh, deliver a next frontier. Rick, thank you so much. Um, I think this will bring us to the end of our discussion. Um, I just want to see if there's any questions that we need to uh, look at. Uh, thank you to everybody for your comments.